Now we consider the question of why it is that we use particular methods when we conduct research. Recall that we defined research as systematic inquiry that describes, explains, predicts, and controls real-world phenomena. Now we'd like to consider more precisely what it is that makes that inquiry systematic and why it's so important that research be systematic. In essence, we can think of four basic control systems um, that ensure that research is systematic. That means that if I conduct a piece of research and one of my colleagues conducts it, that we should get essentially the same answer. We should be able to describe the world the same way and agree that the same types of explanations make sense. Now, this system doesn't always work perfectly in practice. There are important debates but far less than one would think, and most importantly, using these four control systems has allowed there to be significant adv advances in all the sciences, including what I would describe as the much more difficult sciences that involve the study of human behavior. It is much easier, if one thinks about it, to, to study a tree or a tide than it is to study the people that you live with and interact with on a daily basis. The first important control system is training. You are, in fact, embarking on that training process right now, learning um, about standard, standard methods of research, uh, starting with how we design research, and then you will be learning about how we uh, improve our measurement, how we actually measure concepts, um, how we ensure that our research is valid. And it's important that this training is co relatively consistent across uh, different institutions and um, different subfields. Another important control system is replication. Uh, you've probably heard some about this uh, replication, replica so-called replication crisis has in fact been in the news, though again that's a little bit overblown. We could talk about it in class. But in essence the idea of replication is that you can, you, you repeat the study uh, same type of study in different contexts. So you can use another researcher, another sample, um, a different country even. Now sometimes, of course, one will get different answers. So there are some famous economic experiments involving public goods and uh, so-called uh, gifts that it turns out that if you conduct it in with uh, Mongolian uh, tribes, you get very different, people play these games very differently than if you conduct it with American college students from elite private universities. Now that doesn't mean that the experiment isn't replicable so much as we're actually measuring something different. People have different patterns of behavior and respond to the same cues in different ways depending on their context. So that can sometimes be a good thing, not a bad thing, but it's important to keep in mind nonetheless. Finally, you've probably heard of the peer review process. Um, in this case, anytime you see a re research that's published in an academic journal, it will have usually been reviewed by at least two to three people simply for that journal who've been trained in the same research methods and with similar substantive knowledge. Often, though, any paper that is published has actually been through multiple reviews. Not only has it been presented at conferences and gotten feedback, from people who attend the conference, from assigned discussants. People have presented that paper at their own local workshops. And it's not uncommon for an article to have to be sent out three, four, eight <laughs> times. Um, and initially, it gets rejected because there are issues with the research, or sometimes just the peer review process isn't perfect. But setting aside some uh, issues with peer review that have to do with the fact that there's a status quo bias, which means that um, it's harder for more innovative research to get published because people typically prefer what they have um, already believed to be true about the world. In general, the peer review process does work fairly well. The fourth important control system, which has become an increasingly important part of political science research um, in particular, is data and procedure archiving. By this, what we mean is if one goes out and collects a unique set of data, or if you go through and you analyze data 
um, you actually keep these analysis procedures and you make them available for use by other researchers. So part of what we'll be practicing in the later half portion of the class when we start to look at the statistical software that we're going to use is in fact how we can keep a record of what we've done in the statistical software so that it's a syntax file that we could actually make available to other researchers. Now, this is a lot of effort to go through to ensure um, that the, uh, there's a systematic component to the research we conduct. And so why does so much effort go into this? Um, perhaps you're familiar with the Mark Twain curmudgeonly quote of there are three kinds of lies. Lies, damn lies, and statistics. And since so much analysis in the social science, not all, but a lot of analysis in the social science does in fact involve statistics, one has to be very careful that what, what one is reporting in one's research is not simply seen as a lie. Thus the importance um, of all of these control systems to allow us, um, the research community in essence, to identify where there are issues. So um, probably not a lot of you are familiar uh, with a controversy that was quite big in the 1990s, which was the bell curve controversy. This is where these articles, in essence, did some quote unquote, I'm going to call it that, research on intelligence, and tried to, in essence, make the argument that race was a big predictor and genetics were big predictors of intelligence that blacks were simply naturally inferior to some extent their IQs were lower. I'll point out that this book was not published in academic um, journals. It could not get through the academic review process because it was highly problematic. There were assumptions that had gone into the measurement of the data. There were claims that were being made on the basis of the analysis that were not realistic. And in fact, if you look at the academic community, it was People who did any of this type of research were by and large united in their rejection of this as um, an appropriate book, uh, an appropriate piece of, of claims that one could draw on the basis of the underlying data itself. So this is an example of something that made it through to the mainstream, but in fact would not have made it through the control systems of systematic inquiry. Um, another great example of this, you might be familiar with the issues surrounding uh, global warming denial. And this headline here, the peer-reviewed survey finds majority of scientists skeptical of global warming crisis, is a headline. The headline, however, is grossly misleading. There was, in fact, a peer-reviewed survey. However, it did not interview scientists, not at least the way you and I might consider the term scientist. It in, it, the inter people interviewed were geology teachers <laughs> and practicing um, not even practicing geologists, I think primarily middle school and high school science teachers were the people that were interviewed. These aren't necessarily the people that one would think would be the most up-to-date on climate change research. If you actually go into the people who are getting published and who are part of this tight-knit community that is constantly using systematic inquiry, that is, uh, the, the community is subject to the four control procedures we've just outlined, there you find essentially unanimous. In fact, I can't, we always say essentially unanimous in order to allow for the fact there might be one or two people, but I'm not aware of any at all in the, the group of people that are actively conducting this type of research who believe that climate change is not real. Um, finally, we've had many examples, and in fact, there have been some fairly significant ones recently in, even in political science, there was a, a, a study that was published in one of our top journals um, so things can make it through the review process and slip through. However, in the case, one of the control systems is that because people try to replicate, um, mistakes that do make it through, they make it past the training, they make it past the peer review, can still be caught via replication. So in this case, there was a scientist, um, in the case on the slide, a scientist, Stephen Eaton, who was actually jailed for falsifying drug test results. In the political science example, um, there were a series of results regarding how people reacted uh, to door-to-door -door campaigners who came to try to change their attitudes on homosexuality. It turned out that whenever a, 
a young political scientist tried to replicate the study. He was unable to do so. Um, he and two graduate students took a closer look at the actual study in order, so then they tried to, they used the data and procedures that had been archived to try to replicate it and found an anomaly that it appeared that all of the changes were perfectly normally distributed and they realized that the data had actually been faked. So everything was able to be, um, in essence, retracted. Now, it, it's unfortunate that it got as much attention, the initial study got as much attention as it did, but ultimately the control systems were successful. So hopefully these short examples have given you some idea of why the systematic inquiry part of research is of such vital importance and why we will spend most of this course learning how to do things systematically.